So, uh, first, I guess, maybe you could tell me your name and your birth date and, and where you were born. Oh, okay. Ken Anderson, the second. Born in Lamberton, Minnesota in 1925, which makes me 85 years old. Can you believe it? <laughs> and uh, you want to know I, I, a little of my history? Is that what you want me to talk about? Uh, well, maybe you can tell me how you got into airplanes. Oh, I joined the Air Force during World War II. And uh, I, I went into the Air Force because I didn't want to be sludging around in those foxholes on the ground. And it turned out to be a very nice experience. Very, very fond memories of my Air Force days. I got in fairly late in 1943 and the war was over in 1945. So by the time I got through my training, the war was over. But I uh, realized in the Air Force, I had a chance to go into electronic school. And I could see the future there decided I wanted to be an electronic engineer and took some radio electronic training in the Air Force and uh, then went to college directly afterwards. Did you have any direct experience with World War II airplanes? Uh, yes, I, I, I f we flew in a number of them in my training. B-17s, I was a radio operator uh, and a gunner. All, all of the crew on the B-17s, except the pilots, uh, would fire guns uh, when they were in, in combat. And uh, so I had quite a bit of practice in firing 50 caliber machine guns from the radio operator's position on the B-17. So uh, you uh, became an electrical engineer, and then uh, I know you worked for one company, and then you switched companies? Uh, several times, yes. Which companies did you work for? Uh, uh, Just tell me about Consolidated that. Vaulty was my first job after I got out of college, which was you know, nicknamed Convair in San Diego, California. And that's where I uh, was working on the B-36, which was the biggest biggest bomber ever built and, and the biggest bomber that ever has been built. And uh, I was in, in uh, engineering flight test, which means we uh, were the guys that installed the equipment on the airplane. Well, we checked it out on the bench first, installed it in the airplane, and, and then we test flew it. Uh, test flights on the B-36 could run about 10 hours long. Uh, so some, you were actually in the air for 10 hours? At 40, 45,000 feet. It was the, one of the first pressurized airplanes. So uh, like on the, on the B-17, we had to wear oxygen masks during the entire flight, but in the B-36, it was pressurized. And uh, so we just got very warm and comfortable, like, like we were in our living room. Well, you know what I'm going to ask next? How did you go to the bathroom? <laughs> oh, well, they had... Uh, what was called relief tubes on most airplanes, which uh, took care of the weather, water type problems. Uh, I, I guess you were told to go before you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, now I would have had a problem at my age, but younger, you know. It's, uh, so. Anyway, that was that was my first flight test experience with uh, as an engineer. Now you've told me about one experience where you where you might have made a, an error. That well, we might have made a slight error. Yes, I. Uh, this the system was a, a, a bombing navigation system. It would navigate the airplane to a, a particular location, and you put it put the equipment on and turn the autopilot on, and the pilot could just sit up there and. Uh, relax. So we were test flying, we were making bombing runs over a, an area in Southern California that was uh, owned by the military. It was called Plaster City. And uh, so we set up on it and I got it all lined up and we were making our bombing run and we got to the point where we were supposed to release the bombs and that airplane went right up on its nut side and started to make a uh, screaming 
turn, and the pilot was up there swearing, what you know is going on here? And it turns out that uh, I had forgot to set the intervalometer, which was the thing that the computer told to drop the bombs. And uh, there was a little hitch in the thing that if they didn't drop the bombs, the computer says, stay right there until we do. And that uh, what the computer was trying to tell the airplane is not to go beyond that spot until you drop the bombs. And so we made a little change, electrical change in it when we got down that, that uh, bypassed that little feature. So. Uh, and that was the only mistake you ever made. Well, I suppose. <laughs> wasn't wasn't the only only problem we ever had I know and uh, the airplane had 10 engines and not only was it the first flight for the bombing system but it was first flight for the airplane so uh, on frequent flights we'd hear the pilot say uh, engine number three is overheating we're shutting it down and and uh, oil pressure on number Five is uh, too high. We're shutting it down, and I've heard that. You know, I was doing my work, and and I heard those things, and I called up, and said, "Well, how many do we need?" <laughs> and he said, so "We have ten inches." He says, "Oh, I says I can get you back on four inches." So that made me feel a little better. So. And but, what was significant to you about the the B thirty six? Oh, it was it was just a marvelous piece of equipment that. Uh, and, and the uh, Sperry bombing system was the first computer uh, equipment, really, that uh, I think it was ever put on an airplane. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a digital computer like you have nowadays. It was all, all analog, and it was some amazing equipment, really. Servos and uh, cams and gears and synchros and all this stuff that made everything work automatically. So it was, it was very interesting, very interesting. I worked there for probably a year and you know, almost two years, I guess. And then uh, we came to the point where we were expecting our first baby. <laughs> and uh, we were getting all kinds of pressure to come back to Minnesota from the grandparents and whatnot. So. I decided that uh, that uh, Convair wasn't. I wasn't. I didn't see the advancement that I needed to see. So, and I was working with Sperry engineers, and they were. Uh, I thought they were being treated a lot better, from a standpoint of advancement. Mm -hmm. and, and there uh, was also an issue of that you were required to be on the plane during the test. Test runs? Well, that didn't bother me in those days so much as it, it, it did a little later. Uh, no, I, I kind of enjoyed flight testing. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, the Sperry guys said that they would recommend me highly, and I thought, well, I kind of looked into that. And so we headed back east. I was thinking that we'd stop in Minnesota, and uh, when we did, in Minneapolis, we really got to. So I walked over to Minneapolis Honeywell. And, and the uh, engineering were hard to come by. Engineers were hard to come by after World War II. So they gave me a job immediately. So we stayed in Minnesota. Do you remember what you made? Oh my goodness, $100 a week, something like that. In that neighborhood, not much by today's standard, but by those days, $100 a week when we had uh, grown up to $30 a month being a pretty good salary. <laughs> uh, so at Honeywell, I, there was no flight testing. It was just designing uh, rate gyros is what I did. Is it the next airplane on that? No, no airplanes involved here. They were, they were building airplane equipment, mm -hmm. but... Uh, and they went into a number of different... Honey, Honeywell did not... Uh, work with airplanes at all. They just sold the equipment to to people like uh, Hughes and Sperry and so on. Uh, we got back there in, in, uh, in the summertime and it was quite nice. So we, But uh, then I 
we got the winter, and I remembered what Minnesota winters were like. And I remember in April going out, and I had a we had a rent house, rental house, and a and a garage. But during the night, I I had gone out the day, the day before and the evening before, and and scooped out the driveway. But at the night, the plows came through, and just plowed it all full again. So I went back in the house and I told Alice, "Order the Los Angeles paper. We're getting out of here. <laughs> We're not going to spend another winter in this place." And she did, and we did. So. Uh, I only worked for Honeywell for a little less than a year, and then we went out to Minnesota, out to California again, and I got the job with Lockheed. Mm -hmm. And that brings up the next airplane, F-94, which is uh, is what I was working on. And this is also a new new system, which was similar to the Sperry system, and then it was a computer. Uh, navigation fire control system and uh, it fired uh, rockets uh, at a enemy bomber was the purpose of the airplane well uh, what our tests the, I, I did several different but the, the one on the F-94 uh, we were checking out this new fire, fire control system and in addition to that, the F-94 had a little problem in that uh, when, we found out that uh, when the rockets went out around the nose, it caused such a, a disturbance in the airflow that the engine would, what they call, flame out. You know, we, we just, fire would go out and the jet would be sitting there with no power. So uh, you had a choice. What, they had one shot, you could, go into a dive, get the, the turbine wound up, and then there was a, like a shotgun shell in the back that you could fire. And supposedly, if the conditions were right, the flame would come on and you were in business. And if the and, you were heading at the ground yeah. several hundred miles per hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, uh, over at Oxnard, there was an Air Force base that actually had an operating squadron of F-94s. And occasionally, when we were out testing over Vandenberg, those guys would come up, and after we did our mission, they'd we'd, we'd do battle, dog fighting. They had all kinds, and of course, the pilots I was with were ex World War II flyers, and they were hot to go. They, oh. And so we were just all over the sky wow. at 45,000 feet. I wonder if you could do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Me? You, no. Would you just uh, pretend to get each other in your sights? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah we'd kind of get on the other guy's tail, and then he tried to shake him off, and the other guy wouldn't let him, and that kind of thing. Were but, there limitations to the, like, what, what kind of handling did the F-96 have? Could it do complete loops in every direction? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Upside down. And what was its uh, top elevation? Well, we were at flying at about maximum uh, altitude at 45,000. When the, the, the uh, shotgun shell didn't work, I'm going to say that the base down there had starters. So we would go down and dead stick into Oxnard, and, and then they'd pull their starter over and get us going, and then we go again. But, but one of the purposes was to try to figure out how to eliminate this uh, flame out problem along with just checking the, the system itself. And how many uh, rockets did it carry? 24. And what size were they? They were two and three, three quarter inch diameter rockets. So the, a rocket, it, it, it propels itself and it also yeah, has propel. an explosive head of some sort. Yeah, but it doesn't have any control. It's just like you're firing a bullet. It uh, got fins so that it has stability, but it doesn't. There's no. Does it have tracers, or does it, the pilot have an idea of where he's? Is it visible to the eye? Uh, yeah. There's a little smoke comes out of them because they're they're firing, so you can you can see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, we'd get reports back if uh, if there were holes in the banner. I think I was mentioning to you one time point. That 
this, what we were firing at was a banner that was about four feet high and about 20 feet long. And it has all kinds of metal uh, particles through it, so it got good radar return on it. And uh, one of the pilots was determined to break the sound barrier because the F-94 would not. It, it went about, about 600 miles an hour, but it would not go through the sound barrier. So he would get back over Edwards at 45,000 feet, and we would go straight down, wide open, straight down, with the afterburners going. And if, if you would point at your hangar down there, and if you did cut through the sound barrier, you know, it'd be a big boom down there, and everybody would... <laughs> so that's what he was trying to do. Never, never succeeded. So, and I guess that's about the story of the F-94. I can't think of he anything. He said um, on the banners, they were usually several, how far away were they from the, the plane that was trailing them? Oh, I, I think it was about half a mile cable they had, 2,500 feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, oh yeah, I was telling you that one, one day the, the Navy guy that was flying the, the B-45 the tow plane said, uh, I can only get 1,200 feet of cable out. He says, do you want to go ahead and, with the program? And then our old pilot says, well, if it's all right with you, it's all right with me. <laughs> so. And the plane still flew. So. Yeah, yeah we, we, didn't, we didn't hit the bomber. <laughs> F-104, I had not very much to do with. I, I was working for Lockheed when they were first building the, the first uh, model, and I did a little radio checking on it. Uh, was it was a single seat airplane, so there was no uh, engineering test flying involved in that at all. But but uh, didn't spend too much time on that. I did. I suppose I could tell this story. I, I did uh, decide that I wasn't going to fly in high performance jets anymore because I had my, my sweet wife and my darling little daughter at home, and I went to two funerals of pilots that I knew very well who crashed in test flying, and so I said, no, that's enough. And Lockheed said, well, you don't have a job if you don't <laughs> want to fly, so I moved over to Hughes Aircraft at that time. And it was probably one of the best moves I ever made. Because uh, I mentioned earlier that Convair, I, didn't seem like there was a good future there, and I thought the same thing at Lockheed, but Hughes was great. I was always very happy to be there. Never never went, not a, went away from it. And they never required you to test, test fly them, the planes? Uh, no, no. I did do f test flying, but never on a, again on a high performance airplane. I was on. Uh, slowed bombers and whatnot. F-102, that was my first job at, at Hughes. And there again, it was a, similar to the F-94, it was a um, fire control system that, that uh, fired. This, this, this system had missiles, which were guided. In other words, you'd, you'd fire them and uh, they would fire the, they would follow the radar beam that you were tracking the bomber and follow it over the, to the target. So that's the difference between a missile and a rocket? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The missiles were, were guided. Um, and how many did it carry? I think, as I remember, six, six missiles on an, uh, a 102. Mm -hmm. And I got to be a, a group head there, which means I was now the boss. And <laughs> Fairly, fairly early on, I had a group of people working for me. So were, were these planes used in active uh, military interactions that you know of? Uh, nothing in those years that I can think of other than just to test. They were, were there were squadrons Korea? of them. There were squadrons of them in the Air Force, of course, yeah. And uh, like I said, these probably replaced the, the 94s, mm -hmm. the 102s, and uh, the, the, another airplane is just about like it, the 106, which uh, came out, Convair 
again, was building these airplanes. Hughes was putting equipment in. But uh, the 102 had some problems. It wouldn't go supersonic either. So Convair made some changes in design, structure of the aircraft, and came up with what they called the Coke bottle on the 102, which is sort of a slimming of the fuselage. And it did. It was the first um, interceptor aircraft, I think, that would go supersonic in, in level flight. Well, have you ever been in an airplane when it broke the sound barrier? No. 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 Here again. Now, there was a, a T trainer 106 that had two cockpits, but uh, the, the um, military version that was, was just the one seater, so nothing to fly. We did put equipment, early equipment, in some other airplanes, like a, a B B-25, and I did fly a lot of hours on the B-25. Uh, I don't know what one time we told the, the the flight plan was to to go out and do cl ground clutter study. Ground clutter was a kind of a problem with with an airplane because it it uh, you know the, air, the target out there is small and the ground clutter coming back is is big and tried to and that was. Uh, Can you explain what ground clutter is? Well, it's, it's the radar return that comes off the ground and back. And uh, on, a, on a regular radar, it's, it's just all information comes back. What we were developing was the first Doppler radar, which is uh, a radar which segregates out different frequencies. So you can tell what speed, relative speed between your interceptor and whatever it is you're looking at. And that means that you can block out the ground clutter and just see the airplane. Like magic. Which, yeah, well, that was the, the advantage of a Doppler radar. Uh, I remember one... exciting to work on that. <laughs> I remember one flight. We had uh, written up this flight plan. We we're going to do it at 10,000 feet. Check ground clutter at 10,000 feet. We flew out. Happened to be we were out flying over Arizona. We came down the Grand Canyon. Well, at 10,000 feet, uh, actual uh, actual altitude, we were looking at the rims of the Grand Canyon, and flew, we flew all the length down of it, on down the canyon. It was it was it was interesting. Wow! Fun. And I, I I I was up in the nose cone with a big blister there, and the view was 180 degrees, oh. full view. That was fun. Do you ever have dreams about flying? No. I enjoy flying. It's never bothered me. I can remember one day we were we up in a uh, in a in a bale of commercial jet uh, convoy type uh, passenger airplane, and we were uh, it was it was a trainer for. Uh, I don't forget whether it was the Navy or the Army where they had training stations where the guys could get in there and operate the radars and that they would be operating in the airplanes they were going to fly in. And we were testing that. But I remember we were flying low over Los Angeles and uh, it was so bumpy that I looked back, there was about a dozen guys back there at different stations doing tests. And I looked back and they were all <laughs> and I got really mean. I had sack lunch, and I sat up there, and I was eating my bologna sandwich, and they were looking at me and going. <laughs> but it stomach. was so. I remember it was so uh, windy and breezy that I looked out and I saw a newspaper flying by. It was it been sucked up and off the ground. So if you had the opportunity to fly again, if someone. Took you up for a ride? Would you take it? Oh, today? Yeah, sure. I, to me, traveling is the only way to travel is by air. I, I don't care to drive. Done too, done too much of it. The 107. Never actually worked on the airplane. 
The 107 was supposed to be the advanced supersonic interceptor, and we were building a system to go in it at Hughes. Again, a fire control system. And we had it pretty well developed. And they canceled the program. So uh, we thought, well, all our work in vain. But the uh, Air Force office came along and said, no, keep working on it. Keep working on it. Don't tell us anything about why. So that was my experience with the with the 107. So we did we did develop this new, and I was saying it was a Doppler radar and a digital computer, first first airborne digital computer that I think one of the first that was developed, and. Uh, we were, we did flight testing, that was in the B-25, did some of the early equipment there, and we were, we were putting it through its paces up in what we had, the Roof House Laboratories in Culver City. And uh, the guy comes out and he says, we're gonna get you a B-58 to put this equipment in to test. And the B-58 is a bomber, and this is an interceptor equipment. And we thought, well, that's interesting. But uh, we didn't argue. I mean, salaries were, keep, paychecks were keep coming. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned before that my F-94 experience was flying was at Ed Edwards Air Force Base. And back we went to Edwards Air Force Base to install this brand new uh, state-of-the-art equipment in this B-58. And I can remember, <laughs> sadly, that uh, we moved. I moved the family up to Lancaster, California, so that we could be near near work. But uh, the Air Force says we want you to have this ready to flight test by the first of January. We worked. I worked two shifts frequently. You know, from seven in the morning until midnight come home and sleep for four hours and go back in. I was, by this time I was a section head, so I, I had a pretty good crew working with me. But uh, I was conscientious enough not to just tell them to work and go to bed, but I stayed with them. And we did, we got the thing ground tested and it was pretty well ready to fly. And a B-58 somewhere in, in the Air Force world crashed and they, couldn't figure out why, so they grounded the whole fleet, including ours. So there we were, just before Christmas. We had an airplane ready to go, and we couldn't fly it. So after all this hard work, they gave me three weeks off for Christmas, a uh, whole crew. And uh, we finally did get going. The uh, B-58 had three seats, and uh, as a section head, I was able to delegate the good fun of flying in the thing to some of my crew. Uh, John Moore and John Bryant were the two flight operators that I, but they volunteered actually. That was a fun program. Uh, we still didn't know exactly why. Uh, we were testing this in a bomber, uh, but uh, okay. Finally, we, the guy came up and said, "We're going to set up a, a, a security system at, at Hughes Aircraft," and uh, they did set up a whole half uh, top of a, a one building that set up uh, a security door, and uh, then we we got briefed about the YF-12, which was going to be the, the next big high-speed Mach 3 interceptor for the Air Force, and this is where the equipment was supposedly going to go. So we worked in what was called the Black World from there on out. Nobody could, nobody could uh, be aware of what we were doing, not even our family, not even anybody. And you heard of secret and top secret. This was well above top secret. Yeah. 
black programs. Uh, so they bailed three airplanes. They finally, we'd, we'd, by this time, we'd pretty well uh, gotten through the B-58 testing and it was all going well and everybody was happy with it. Uh, I, uh, the, the Air Force officer on the, on the uh, program that was sitting in an office next to mine turned out to be one of the astronauts that landed on the moon. And I was, I'm sitting here trying to think of his name, but that, uh, Jim, uh, okay, but anyway. Uh -huh. No, no. So we got uh, cranked out three systems for these three airplanes. And again, by then I was boss enough, so I, uh, by the time the B-58 program was over, I was back in Culver City. My department manager had me come back, and this was t to get these three systems built and, and checked out for installation in the air, in the, air, in the YF-12s. Um, you know, some of the things that we did, like when we'd go over to, we'd go over to Lockheed, to uh, do the engineering to check out the thing in the in the airplane, which is sitting in the hangar over there, uh, the security guy would say, "Now, when you're going over on the freeway in a company car, he says, I want you to once or twice get off the freeway and circle around and get back on and see if anybody's following you." <laughs> he was a nut, <laughs> but that's the kind of precautions we were going through. I uh, was able to work with Kelly Johnson, which who was a very fairly famous aircraft designer, who was the head of the Skunk Works uh, at Lockheed. What was he like? Very nice guy. Very nice guy. He's no longer living, but uh, you can he's he, he's in the uh, in the Hall of Fame in uh, the Air Force. I saw his name when I was there, and uh, also uh, Tony Levere was one of my favorite pilots at Lockheed. His his name is in there as being fairly famous. So uh, probably enough of the of the uh, B fifty eight. We'll go on to the YF twelve here. Korea, or were these I don't think it ever, as, as far as I know, it never got into active, any military operation other than testing. And, and I don't think they actually probably didn't build more than 100 of them. This is called the YF-12, but it isn't. It's an RS-71, but it's close enough. Same airframe, it's just the uh, YF-12 had three cockpits. And uh, this one, I think, had only... Some of them had one, some of them had two. So what, is the, what, what was the purpose of the YF-12? Again, an interceptor. Versus the RS-71 was a strictly a, a, a reconnaissance, uh, flying high over the, over the Russia, Russia and taking pictures and that kind of thing. So you didn't need three, three chairs for that? Didn't, didn't need the three chairs for that. And camera equipment mostly, camera and uh, electronic uh, uh, equipment. So how long were you working on that, those two projects? Oh, uh, we went up to Edwards on the B-52, I think in about 1962, or 61 or 62, and we're up there for several years. And I think the YF-12 probably came into Edwards at about 64. Uh, actually, we started testing it at, at the ranch, which is a secret base out in California that nobody knows about. Uh, and my crew was flying out there to do the test, test work. And then this was uh, during the election of uh, 1964, when Johnson was up for re-election. And he was being criticized by the press for uh, not keeping the military up. And he says, boy, he says, you fellows 
we have an airplane, <laughs> this is the one that's been, we have an airplane that'll knock your socks off, it'll go <laughs> mock down, blah, 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 blah. One of the best kept secrets in military history is unveiled by President Johnson at his first general news conference since taking office just 100 days ago. His startling announcement is that after five years, the U.S. has developed a jet high-altitude interceptor capable of flying long distances at 2,000 miles an hour, three times the speed of sound. The United States has successfully developed an advanced experimental jet aircraft, the A-11, which has been tested in sustained flight at more than 2,000 miles an hour and at altitudes in excess of 70,000 feet. The performance of the A-11 far exceeds that of any other aircraft in the world today. The development of this aircraft has been made possible by major advances in aircraft technology of great significance for both military and commercial applications. Several A-11 aircraft are now being flight tested at Edwards Air Force Base in California. So <laughs> the military was in sheer horror, the Air Force, but it, it was kind of helpful to us because they, they brought the, the three YF-12s down to Edwards from the base way up in the desert and uh, showed it to the press, had a press conference. To, so that meant we could not stop this nuisance of flying all the way up to up to the desert and uh, work out of Edwards. So when you first saw the design, the, the body design, what did you think? Do you remember being shocked how different it was? Well, yeah. yeah it was a very impressive bird. Very impressive bird. And uh, all we did essentially the same kind of thing we were doing on the F-94 at uh, over Vandenberg. The only difference was with this this bird, instead of just going up there and making a pass, you'd you'd uh, you'd take off out of Edwards and it would go down to Albuquerque, make a turn and come up the Mexican border, getting up altitude and speed at, at Mach three, in uh, time to get up over uh, out the uh, Vandenberg firing range and fire at forty thousand feet. Uh, and how long did that loop take? Oh, half hour maybe, not less. I mean, he's going Mach 3, which is 23, 2200 miles an hour. So, didn't take too long. But it took him that long to get the altitude. And it was all jet? What, what propelled it? Just all jets, yeah. Yeah, all jets. Whereas the, the B-36 was four props, and six props and two jets. Four jets. Is it more difficult to handle at low speeds, like for landings and takeoffs? Or? I don't think that the power made that any difference. It's, you know, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, I, as far as I know, uh, I know that temperature was a problem, and this was the first use of titanium along the leading edge of the wings because they got so hot that they would have melted the aluminum or any other metal you wanted to put on titanium would take the high temperatures. That's your favorite bird of all the ones you worked on? Probably the most spectacular. Yeah, I think that uh, that they did just for the heck of it. They took some YF-12s as a as a as a test speed test range that goes from uh, somewhere around Edwards out into Nevada somewhere where they have timing devices where they can look up and they can test your speed. And I think the our YF-12s ran that a few times just for the heck of it and probably still have the manned aircraft speed record in the, of the world for after, what, 40, 40 years. Just, now they're talking about building something that's going to be as fast or faster. I think we're about to the end of my uh, airplane <laughs> stories here. Did you build any spaceships? <laughs> well, in... Uh, in about 1970, I decided that I didn't want to be a flight test engineer anymore, so I went to the 
the uh, overhead satellite business. That's where I spent the last 10 years of my career. And most of that in Denver. So, end of story? Well, Want to hear more? That brings you to this whole second half of your life. That's, the is last, that where you met Donna? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, she worked. She worked at Hughes at uh, at the uh, ADF too. But uh, that program was also just as secret as the as the YF12 program was uh, up until just recently. Um, it kind of replaced the RS-71 because now we had satellites up there that could do the same thing and send pictures back and RF uh, uh, 